May God be glorified through us as we gather to worship him this morning. Uh, welcome to this gathering of Cedar Point Baptist Church. I want to invite you to turn to the back page of your bulletin. Just a couple things to mention this morning. Um, two, the first two announcements are things that are not happening today as they ordinarily would today or, or this coming week. There is no event for the church this afternoon, so take the afternoon off. Feel free to rest up, invite somebody over to your home. Um, study God's Word, and I'm not forbidding watching any football, but that's that's a conversation between you and the Lord. Uh, this, after, this, this Tuesday afternoon as well, we continue on pause for our kids' Bible studies. Uh, we, are, we have a number of things moving in our schedule this, this fall that makes in some vacation time and family in town for us, which makes it difficult for me to keep that going. We're going to look at it and evaluate what our options are when we get to the beginning of 2022. The only other things I want to mention to you um, the only other single thing is that next Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, we plan to hold a brief members meeting. We have some new members to vote into the church next Sunday afternoon, and then we're going to go straight from that into a time of sermon discussion, sermon review. So Drew and Jason suggested that we, that we start this a few months ago. We've done it, I think, once so far, um, just as a way for us to dig deeper every now and then on a Sunday afternoon into the, into the text we've studied in the, in the, in the morning to give you a chance to ask whatever questions you may have, and also to help us, to lead us as a church, to think more deeply about how the scripture that we've considered applies to us in our, in our daily lives. Those are all the announcements that we have. So this is a bit of a quiet week, but things coming up important next Sunday, and we'd ask you now to pause for just a moment to prepare, to prepare our hearts for the importance of worshiping the Lord 
throughout our service now, throughout the rest of our time together. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we grasp the significance of this text, we're called, Father, by all means to just open up our minds and our hearts and our voices in praise to you, to praise you in your sanctuary, to praise you for your mighty deeds, and most importantly, we are to praise you for your excellent greatness. Father, all creation, you have designed for this very purpose, to ring with praise to the one who has called us into existence, those things that have never and never were. This call to us to praise is not optional, but essential. It is essential as the chief end of our existence. We were created to glorify you, Father, and with all our being, To be caught up in praise for you, Father, should be the delight of our lives, but often it is not. So, Father, we come to confess to you that we often find ourselves being tempted by our own own desires to commit a spiritual suicide. It happens every time we begin to praise lesser things, money, ourselves, possessions, jobs, power, the praises of men, rather than the infinite worth of the one who is supreme over all. Father, when we do these things, we fail to receive the pleasure and the joy intended as we gaze upon your infinite glory and beauty. We confess, Father, that often our hearts fail to be moved by what is apparent in your word, the glory of God in the face of Christ. Father, we confess that each of our days are numbered and that we waste so much of our time on useless and empty endeavors, groping around in hopes of being satisfied by those things that will never bring us satisfaction. Father, we long for the comfort and security that the world claims to offer. We hunger and thirst after worldly pleasures, and our hearts and our flesh seek not the courts of your dwelling place, but the glitter and the prosperity of a culture that is all but forgotten that you are God. And our very existence is dependent on you. Father, we confess that we care little for the things above and we seek the treasures of the world. We are listless when it comes to our devotion to you. We find little satisfaction in the incarnate word. We stumble and fall, fail as husbands loving our wives, as wives loving their husbands, and as children being obedient to their parents. We believe and trust in the world's provisions and we presume upon your grace and mercy as though it should be there for us whenever and wherever we need it. Lord, we confess that it is your omnipotent power that keeps us from drifting into unbelief and waking us up this very morning as believers. For it was you who have chosen us and not us first having chosen you. Father, it is because you have given given us to Christ and to all those whom you have given will be kept forever and not one will be lost. So, Father, in our hearts this morning... We confess our sinfulness and seek the one who has come as the incarnate word of God to die in our place, shedding his own blood to make us clean. The one who has overcome death, resurrected to your right hand, and who never ceases to offer intercession on on behalf of his people. You have placed their faith in him. We come now this morning to Christ, the bread of life to satisfy our hunger and to drink deeply from the well of living water. It is in the name of Christ and to praise his glorious grace that we pray. Amen.
We're going to be reading from Leviticus chapter 25, 
verses 35 through 43 this morning. And what we learn in Leviticus is greed, especially at the expense of a fellow Hebrew, was condemned. Generosity and not greed was God's expectation of the Israelites, since the Lord had given so freely to them. They were in financial positions that enabled them to share freely with others only by God's grace towards them. The goal was for all members of God's covenant to enjoy the fruit of the land because it was each family's inheritance from God. The land's produce was plenteous and unending as long as the people acknowledged the lordship of God by practicing his commandments. We relate that to our text today in Luke 16, is that the only wealth that will endure is that which has been invested in others for the sake of Christ and the gospel. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so often anxious as we look around and survey not only our culture but the world. We are often caught off guard by the chaos that appears to be getting worse with every passing day. Our thoughts are formed so often by what we watch on TV, listen to through social media platforms. The things that were once considered right are now wrong, and the things we saw as wrong are considered by many to be right. Lord, we struggle to find peace in a world that seems void of any truth. We are continually being programmed to think and act in ways that clash with everything we thought was right. And yet, Father, your word clearly tells us that claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanging the glory of you, Father, for images made mainly in our likeness. We have only one choice to be made and one path to follow, the path that leads to life and godliness, the path that drives us to our knees in humility, the path that leads to the cross, the path that opens our eyes to Christ, the path that takes us to the infallible word where we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. So, Father, we confess that unless you move in our lives, we are without hope in this world. Yet you have moved in our lives by giving us your spirit through whom we are given life, progress and sanctification, gifts of grace, wisdom from above, power to overcome sin. For Your spirit is forever our helper, intercessor, and advocate to the praise of the glory of your grace. So, Father, we pray for all those here and those that are unable to attend that we all may find our peace and our joy in you. We pray for the uncompromising hearts as we live life. We pray that we no longer fall prey to the schemes of the God of this world. We pray, Father, that you would protect us from the evil one and our desires would be for the things not seen and we would know and trust the promises given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that our hearts would no longer be compromised with the comforts of this world, but rather we would be captured by the beauty of all that your Son is for us in life and in death. Oh, Father, let your word flourish in our hearts. Let us be made aware of our need and cause us to hunger and thirst for you alone. Help us, Father, to taste and see that you are good and there is nothing that we desire on this earth besides you. Father, we pray this morning for those who have come with anxious hearts, physical bodies that need your healing care. And we pray that those who continue with ongoing issues would find comfort and grace in their time of need. We lift up to your throne of grace, the Terry family from High Point Baptist Church. We do not yet fully understand or do many of us know who they are, all that has happened, but we have been made aware of a tragedy and the loss of their son, Audric. We ask, Father, for your mercy and grace to be poured out into their lives. We pray for the body of High Point that they would pour out their love and comfort in unmeasurable portions in this grievous time. May we all lift this family up before your throne of grace with unceasing prayer that would cover them in the days and the weeks to follow. May you fill their hearts with the truth that all things work together for good for those who love you, Father, and are called according to your purpose. 
May your peace reign in their hearts and may your presence be known in ways that bring comfort and healing to their broken hearts. Father, we now turn and pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world who have already celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. We pray that the messages spoken would create life and give meaning where hopelessness abounds and in many places where darkness blinds so many from seeing the light of the gospel. Father, we pray for the churches in Iraq, both in Erbil and Duhok. We pray and lift up to you David Lawrence and his wife Chris as they serve the people in the power that you, Father, provide. Create in that place strong gospel life in the believers that attend. We pray for their small group ministries to flourish and the provision would be made for their increased size. We pray for Elizabeth and Ryan Copas as they serve in Erbil. We pray that in all circumstances, they would stand in the grace that you have provided and will continue to give to them. We pray for continued fruitfulness in the gospel and that the door for the gospel proclamation would swing open. May all of their needs be met in the sufficiency of all that you provide through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, may you continue to strengthen their marriage and may their family flourish in the light of your marvelous grace. And Father, we pray also this morning for 17 missionaries who were taken captive by a gang in Haiti. Lord, all 17 mothers and fathers and children, we ask, Lord, for your protection of their lives. And Father, we pray that you would strengthen them in grace, that your spirit would be rest on them in this time of tragedy. Father, so we ask that you would be with them, guide them, and free them from their captives. And Father, we pray for Brian McKenna, for the family and continued strengthening of the ministry of Training Leaders International. Lord, we give you praise for the growth of the ministry. We pray for the recent setbacks in facilitator training due to pastors unable to attend. We pray that Brian would trust in your timing and that he would know that these setbacks are governed by your providential hand. We would ask, Lord, that you would continue to provide financially to both Brian and to the ministry. We pray for new supporters and increased giving. Father, we continue to praise you for those diaspora pastors who have been both encouraged and growing through the TLI ministry. Father, we pray for continued wisdom that these men would be served well through the training provided. We pray that you would continue to strengthen Brian in his desire to serve and that you would guard his heart from the corruptness of this evil age. Father, we continue to pray for spirit-led guidance and provision as we continue to test the warders concerning a permanent home for our body to meet. Lord, we ask for patience, that we would trust in your leading as we would seek opportunities that become available. Father, we are thankful, so thankful, Father, for you always having met all our needs. You have faithfully provided shelter for our church in all times and in all situations, and we will continue to look to you for our provision as we gather on Sunday mornings to worship you. Father, strengthen our resolve to know your word and to make you known in all the events of our daily lives. And Father, we pray for our local leadership, both here in Cedar Park and Leander. We pray first for those who by your authority lead, the mayor of Cedar Park, Corbin Van Arsdale, and the mayor of Leander, Christine Sedquist. We pray that above all else, that they would fear you and your authority over all things. We pray that they would govern justly in all matters, that they would punish those who do wrong and reward those who do right. We pray that the people of Cedar Park and Leander would be given wisdom as they consider the many financial expenditures that will be on the ballots this year. Father, provide the necessary truth that is required so that the right decisions would be made and monies would be used in ways that care well for the flourishing of your people and the gospel proclamation here in Cedar Park and Leander. And Father, we pray for those who are making decisions in matters of policy in our federal courts, Senate, Congress, and the executive branch, that they would submit to you, Father, for you are the one who has all authority in all situations, in all areas of life and death. For you, Father, are Lord of all knowledge, and by your hand are actions weighed. So therefore, Father, we pray for our leaders, that they would be wise and be warned, that they would serve not their own selfish desires, but with fear of the one who can break them with a rod of iron, 
and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Father, direct their hearts. Give them wisdom and compassion for the weak and the vulnerable and strength to do what is right and just in your sight. Let your truth reign where all false falsehoods now reside. Give your church the discernment that is needed as it navigates the waters of uncertainty. Strengthen the hearts of your people that we may find hope not in our government, but in your sovereign authority over all nations. And Father, we pray for our families, for our marriages and the children that you have graciously given to us. Father, pour out your wisdom into the minds of parents in order that they may be fully equipped for the difficulties of teaching their children in an age when all the forces of darkness seek to confuse and obscure the light of truth. And where all the proportions of power in this world will appear to make you, Father, look distant and you small and you ineffective like nothing. Father, show mercy to us, parents, husbands, wives, singles, children, that we may flourish and be fruitful in the truth and in your keeping. Father, be with us now as we seek your face in the word spoken and proclaimed here this morning. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may see wonderful things in your word. Give strength this morning to your witness and engulf our hearts with your presence. And Lord, may our lives be forever changed by what we see and hear this morning. It's in the name of our precious Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Oh. 
And children, in kindergarten through fourth grade, if you're participating in Kids Point this morning, you all may be dismissed out to the back of the room and to your classroom. It looks like Pastor Jason will be leading you there today. You have no doubt heard the phrase, follow the money. Maybe you use the phrase, maybe you use it often. Maybe you find that as your life uh, gets longer and longer that you use that phrase more and more often. So a senator changes his vote one way or the other on a controversial spending plan at the last moment, and you think, follow the money. Your favorite football team changes conferences, and you say, follow the money, and you're probably right. There's a construction craze in your city. You want to build a shed in your backyard or a fence, and you can't get, you can't get the building permit to get that done. Everybody's stacked up, waiting for months on end. Meanwhile, the major commercial developer sees their plan sail right through the city council, and you think, follow the money. Just yesterday, I heard an interview of two former congressmen talking about how both parties, two, two congressmen from both parties, talking about how both parties uh, assign committee leaders, chairman and, sub, and, and subcommittee chairman, to influential committees, not based on how hard they work on legislation, not based on how much they know, how much expertise they have in the specific field under the oversight of that committee but major committee chairmanships are assigned based on how much money they raise for their party, for their political party. And we say, follow the money. Now, some people say it's dangerous to talk about money in church, and maybe it is. But Jesus talked about it. We come to Luke chapter 16 today. You know how we've been going through Luke. I'm not picking the stuff I want to preach. We're taking one chapter after another, one passage after another. And today we come to a passage where Jesus talks about money. He talked about it a lot. It made the Pharisees mad. In fact, next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll see how the Pharisees reacted angrily when Jesus talked about money. There was those same Pharisees who wanted Jesus dead. And we might say, follow the money. But why does Jesus talk about money so much? I wonder, and I guess I should say, I suspect because if we follow the money in our own lives, it leads us directly to the condition of our own hearts. Follow our money, where it goes, how it's used, what we use it to accomplish or acquire, and we learn a lot about what we really love, about what we really treasure, about where we think our investment of life and treasure is likely to pay off about we, what we really seek to accomplish in our lives. We could say that follow the money in our hearts and it leads us to what we worship. So I want us to ask this question of ourselves this morning. Am I following Jesus or am I following the money? Let's look at, look at chapter 16 of Luke's gospel. I'll begin reading in verse 1, and, and we'll study down, Lord willing, through verse 13 today. But I want you to see three implications of, of money in our lives. Three implications of money and how we treat it, how we use it for following Jesus. And I want you to see first here in verses 1 through 9 that following Jesus means investing money shrewdly. Now, that might not be what you expect Jesus to say, that following Jesus means investing our money shrewdly. You may have an idea in mind of what that looks like, but that, might, that idea might be different from what Jesus means. So let's begin by looking just at the first part of verse 1 in Luke 16. He, this is Jesus, Jesus also said to the disciples. So I want you to notice who he's talking about. So remember back to last week when we walked through chapter 15, Jesus was eating with who? He was eating with the tax collectors and the sinners the people that the religious upper crust in society, the people that they despise, the people that they viewed as traitors or as morally, morally suspect. And the Pharisees and the scribes 
complained about Jesus. And so all the way through chapter 15, Jesus is talking to the, to the religious elites, the people who tried to cross all their T's and dot all their I's spiritually, and then they wanted everybody to know about it. But here in chapter 16, he's talking about, talking to the disciples. So Jesus, Jesus confronts everybody, okay? He's an equal opportunity confronter, an equal opportunity offender. He sees all in every last one of us whether we are the self-righteous spiritual elite or whether we are those who think of ourselves as his faithful followers who in our hearts love something else or whether we are the tax collectors and the sinners who recognize that we need to hear the words of Jesus. Jesus knows. He knows what is dominating our minds even while his word is being preached. What will he see over these next few minutes? He sees our hearts, and he calls on all to repent, regardless of how we have responded to him. He sees what's left over of which we need to repent. And then Jesus tells a story. In the story, he compares his disciples to, to managers, not mere servants. Okay, In the story of the, of the prodigal son and the, and the father and then the older self-righteous son, there were servants present. We didn't talk about them much last week. Disciples, though, are not merely servants in Jesus' household. We're, we're, we're managers. And in the story that Jesus tells, the, the, the manager is the second in command to, to a rich man. Now, Meredith and I spent some time this past week in Waco, where, as you all know, Chip and Joanna Gaines have built for themselves an empire, right? Not, not just a TV show, but they have built a, a network, a network of a TV network, home design network, involved in renovation and retail shops and restaurants, magazines, and even, as I understand, real estate. Who knows what all else they'll get their hands into before it's done. And I don't say that demeaningly. We got to eat in, in, for breakfast in one of the restaurants. And, and, and you know what we didn't see there? We did not see, believe it or not, we did not see Joanna Gaines running the restaurant. Okay, she's got managers for that. She's got people in her business who manage the managers. And some of those managers have been tasked with a special set of, of responsibilities. They are people who are able to, to, they have the authority to make deals on her behalf, to negotiate the deals, to sign the contracts. And that's similar to what we see in this story with the manager who works for the rich man. Look with me there at the second half of verse 1 on into verse 2. This rich man had a manager, and charges were brought to him, uh, brought to the rich man, that this man, the manager, was wasting the rich man's possessions. And he called him. The rich man called his manager and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. Obviously, this manager isn't getting the job done. At best, he's negligent. At worst, he is dishonest, a thief. He is wasting the rich man's possessions, verse 1 tells us. When the rich man realizes this through the reports, apparently from co-workers, he fires the manager, but not fast enough. Watch what happens in verses 3 through 7. And the manager said to himself, knowing what's coming down here, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, the people who owed money to his master, as he, sum he summoned them one by one, and he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. Quick note here. All right, these are massive amounts of of wheat and oil, okay? These are years' worth of wages that he's discounting in an attempt to, to cut these deals with the, the, the people who owe money to his master. So when this manager sees that his time is running out, he goes to the businessmen, the businessmen who owe his boss money, and he, and he re renegotiates the deal, okay? He essentially gives them a discount on what they owed to his boss, the rich man. Well, why would he do this? Well, he, he's thinking shrewdly, he's thinking connivingly, we might say. He sees that his time in management is over, all right? And he looks at his options, and he can't bear the thought of physical labor or of, of begging simply to survive. 
So he realizes I got to use what options I have to make some friends, to make some friends quick. Now, some biblical, some biblical interpreters want to, want to prove that the manager here is acting ethically. Jesus is telling this story, and they want to vindicate him um, as if Jesus wouldn't be in some way glorifying a man for doing something that's unethical. And they offer some theories for how these deals that the manager offers are okay, a way to make the case that they are ethical. I'm skeptical about that, okay? I don't see, as I read just the the language of the text, I don't see a way in which this man is acting ethically. He is acting shrewdly. He's acting in his own best interest for survival. It seems to me that the man simply says this, look, both of you owe my boss big bucks. Pay up now and and I'll give you a discount. This is a deal that will work out well for both of us. So now, after they renegotiate the contracts, the debtors don't owe his master. Now they owe him. He's made the terms more advantageous for them. And so then when he's out of a job, then what will he be able to do? He, the manager, out of work, will be able to call in favors from these debtors because of the immense amounts of money that he saved them. By hook or crook, he's determined to become a survivor. The story concludes here in in verse 8, the beginning of verse 8, where where, uh, the master says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Now, many readers see this and ask, how could the master commend his manager when he just got cheated out of a big chunk of what he was owed? For, how could he can commend his servant for this obvious corruption? Well, look closely there at that beginning of verse 8. Does the master commend his manager's integrity? No. He commends his, his shrewdness. I mean, I can imagine sort of the dry sense of humor of the manager thinking, well, you've done well for yourself here. Well done, you've done shrewdly. You've taken care of your needs, even if you were unethical. And this is where Jesus applies the story. This is where Jesus drives home the lesson to his disciples. Look with me at the end of verse 8. For the sons of this world, this is Jesus' commentary, I think. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Let me give you my paraphrase on on that end of verse 8. Often, Christians aren't too sharp with money. That is far too often the case. Thank you for that amen. I think I thank you for that amen. I'll take what I can get, huh? The sons of this world, Jesus says, the people who live for the here and the now, the sons of this world are far too often far more shrewd with money than we are. Why should that be the case? What reason is there for the people who don't live for something higher than this life to be more shrewd with our money, with their money, than we are? Maybe a story's coming to your mind right now. A church that that wasted the money that, that the folks gave. Maybe a story's coming to your mind of a of a church embezzlement due to financial sloppiness. Christians who gave money to, to con artists posing as people in need. Some of us have been there. I've been there. Not with your money. But believe me, I've been there. And maybe it's true. Maybe there's something about Christians that, that, that makes us reliably gullible. Maybe we could come up with different, uh, different explanations. But I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about, not specifically. Look closely with me at verse 9. This is a tough verse, okay? There, there are some options for interpreting this that, are, that seem valid, but I'm going to give you what I think is the most likely meaning that Jesus offers when he says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. I see a clue there in his final words, the two last words in that sentence, that they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. So I don't believe this is about making friends in this world so that when our money runs out, when we've spent it all, when the employment checks stop coming, that we'll have somebody who will give us a house to live in. 
I do not believe this is what Jesus is telling a story about. Even those dwellings are temporary. They won't last forever, right? No, Jesus is talking here, I believe, about making friends who will welcome us when we arrive at our eternal dwellings. Jesus is saying, use your money, spend your money shrewdly now so that you will be warmly welcomed when you, when you arrive into God's house. That's what Jesus teaches, is our eternal dwelling place. Okay, so you don't just find eschatology in Revelation. That's not the only place in your Bible where you find the doctrine about the future. We're finding it here in Jesus' teaching, long before Revelation is written. Jesus teaches, Jesus teaches us to live now, to invest your money now, in such a way that the kingdom of God will be expanded and so that you will be welcomed into it with open arms by people who go ahead of you, people who welcome you into the new heavens and the new earth. When, as Jesus says here in verse 9, when, when, uh, got my eyes off of it, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it, when unrighteous wealth, when the money of our lives, when it fails, not when it runs out, but when it's gone, when it doesn't matter anymore, that you, may be re- that you may be welcomed into the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is saying, make better investments. Jesus is saying, no matter whether you know anything about the stock market or not, you can make better investments than Warren Buffett. I heard just over the last couple of weeks about a group of investors who are tracking the investments that are made by a highly influential member of Congress. That person's spouse is making investments that are raking in huge amounts of money. And so these investors are tracking the investments made by the spouse of the member of Congress, and they're making big piles of money too. Maybe that's not not a bad investment plan. I'll let you think about that for yourself. But Jesus is saying, make even better investments than that. Jesus says, invest in a sure thing. Some of you know about Dave Ramsey. Maybe you've studied or even taught Dave Ramsey. He's got a line, as I've found the quote, if you will live like no one else, later you can live like no one else. Have you heard that quote before? Live like no one else now, so you can live like no one else later, something along those lines. People who've studied Ramsey's material more than I have tell me that he, he says, he means, make tough choices now, make sacrifices now, smart choices now, so that later in your life, you can live it up. You can live like no one else later. Now, I'm here to say there's something to living frugally and saving, but I'd want to say to Dave Ramsey, aim higher. Aim higher than living it up later in your life. Aim at investing what you have now, not for when you're 60 or 70 or 80 or 50 if you retire earlier. Aim to invest for when you're a million and 50 years old. That's where you want your true riches to be. Jesus is saying, use your money now so there will be people to welcome you into eternity. Don't aim to retire young and rich. Don't aim at living comfortably into your 80s. Aim at eternity and store your treasure there. Send your treasure, send people into heaven ahead of you by the way that you spend your money now. That's what Jesus means when he says, spend your money shrewdly, more shrewdly than the sons of this earth, as he says. Friends, this is where we all need to understand. We need to face the reality that you and I need eternal shelter. This life will end, but your soul and ultimately your body will not cease to exist. You will spend eternity somewhere. And you need shelter in that eternity. I mean, we've learned over the course of the last year that our homes don't hold up so well, all right? Some of us had major damage done by the freeze back in the winter, right? Some of us had major done, still getting roofs replaced from the hailstorm that hit up in Leander in, in, uh, in, in the spring. Our roofs didn't survive. Our plumbing didn't survive. And if our homes failed us during the freeze and then during the hail, Surely our shelter, surely our homes will not protect us when God's judgment falls upon this earth. When God separates the sheep and the goats 
and sends the sheep into his dwelling place that will last forever and sends those who have rejected his son into a dwelling place that will likewise last forever, but forever under his just judgment. God provides shelter. The ironic thing is that God provides shelter from his own judgment. He judged his own son so that we could escape the judgment that we deserve to fall upon us. So friends, Jesus came. He came to offer himself as the sacrifice to take the justice that our sin deserves. But he also came, as we saw last week in Luke 15, he came to seek the lost treasure. He came to seek the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And that's what we are. We, by nature, are lost. And Jesus came to to, to seek and to save that which was lost, to gather us into his eternal shelter. So friends, Jesus says now, just as he has sought after that which was lost, so now you invest your money in such a way that people will be gathered into heaven to await you and to welcome you. And so we should ask ourselves, how are we spending money in ways that are that are really foolish investments. All right, am I saying you should never eat out? I mean, I'd be a hypocrite if I suggested that that's what it means. Am I saying you should never spend money on a vacation? Well, I told you, my wife and I, we just did. Am I saying you need to dump cable and drive the junkiest car and live in the smallest house in the cheapest neighborhood? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I mean, am I saying you shouldn't invest any money in the stock market, in retirement savings? No, I'm not saying any of those things. Well, then you might ask, Ben, Ben, what are you saying then? Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I believe Jesus is saying. Friends, my brothers and sisters, we better be wrestling with these financial choices that we make. I'm afraid that we don't. I'm afraid that we that we assume that because we that we can't, because we can have, that we therefore should have. I'm afraid that as generally prosperous Americans, we have allowed to to build up in our hearts a sense of a sense of entitlement. I mean, it's not just those millennials that are the entitled ones, right? We all have that sense built into our hearts that we deserve, that we ought to have, that somebody owes us. And so, brothers and sisters, I'm asking you, have you studied your own hearts and how your hearts have followed your money? Have you studied your own money and where it goes and where it's leading you? to find your treasure. When have you sat down with your spouse, with your family, looked at your budget, looked at your credit card statement, and asked yourself where that money goes? When have we weighed hard choices? I mean, look over your credit card statement, your checking checking record, and think for a moment, what does this say that I really love? What does this record of transactions say is most precious to me, most valuable to me? And we should ask ourselves, when have we weighed making hard choices, making sacrificial cuts in our spending in things that we like and things that we enjoy, things that hurt to get rid of, because we wanted to use our wealth to make eternal friends? Have we? Have I? So I want to encourage us first as a church. I'll have some words to us as individuals in a minute, but first as a church. Let us aim to increase every year. Okay, in a couple months, we're going to vote on a budget. Let us aim to increase every year for as long as we can the percentage of our church budget that we send out. You want to grab a word for that? Send out to missions to spread the gospel, to train gospel workers, missionaries and pastors and other Christian workers, and to plant churches. In this area, you know, in Williamson County, Travis County, Central Texas, and in other parts of Texas across the United States and the ends of the earth, can we, Cedar Point, can we set a goal of increasing not just the raw dollars, but the percentage of what we have send more out every year? You know, we've Drew prayed during, er, earlier in the service that God would 
lead us to the opportunity to have a permanent home for this church. And I affirm that 100%. I pray regularly to that end. But let us pray and act and give in such a way and, and, and enter into a real estate transaction maybe someday in such a way that it does not limit the amount of money that we can send to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. If, 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 if acquiring a permanent church home a permanent place for this church to have a home, if it would reduce our commitment to the Great Commission, then it can't possibly be a good decision. Pray that God would give us wisdom as we evaluate those opportunities and those choices that we may have the chance to make one day. I mean, we give. Do you know what percentage our church gives to church planning, evangelism, missions outside? It's about 13% of our budget, okay? Not bad. Just dream for a second. What would it take? Could God make it possible that we could get to 50% of our budget spent not for us, not for our good? Now, there's good reasons to spend money for the sake of this congregation, all right? But what if we could get to 50%? What if we could be an engine for church planting by the power of the Holy Spirit as we give and pray and work sacrificially towards that end? And I said, we're going to speak to our goals as a church. Let me speak to you as individuals. Could you increase the percentage that you give personally? I don't have any idea what anybody in this room, I guess, except I could make a ballpark guess for my wife and me. I don't know what, any, what percentage any of you give uh, of your income to this church. But I want to ask you, what choices, what choices would it take for us as families to bump that from 0% to 1%, from 10% to 11%, from 20 to 25 would those be good choices for us to make? Would we look back 10 or 20 or a million years from now and regret that choice? And maybe you're saying, there the pastor goes, he's in it for the money, you know, he's thinking about how he can increase his salary and benefits. Okay, fine then. Take one, one additional percent of your income and don't give it to the church, all right? But use it, use it to fund a venture to invite non-Christians into your house. Create a, a hospitality budget. All right, that will fund you inviting your neighbors and your coworkers and people you meet at Starbucks or people you meet here at the rec center or wherever it is that you work, inviting them into your home. And 1% of your budget, you might be able to have steak and lobster maybe even. So if that, look, if that's what it's going to take for us to redirect our priorities into gospel spreading work is setting aside an additional 1% and not letting the church get a dime of it, but you'll use it for the sake of the gospel, for leading people into eternal dwelling places, I will, I will jump up and down and shout and praise the Lord. Because I think that's what Jesus is calling us to here. Friends, I am not issuing commands. You'll notice that here. I'm offering you questions to consider, and I'm making some suggestions for how you could answer that question. But here's a clear statement. Look down with me at verse 9. Verse 9 says, Verse 9 um, says that G Jesus says, Make friends of yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. So here's what Jesus says. If you're not using your money for the sake of things that are eternal, then you better repent, and I better too. So friends, Jesus says following him means investing shrewdly. The first point, point is much, more, much longer than the second two, I will assure you. But we see in verses 10 through 12 that following Jesus also means valuing our money accurately. Following Jesus means valuing our money accurately. Look with me at verse 10. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So the principle probably seems pretty clear here. If we're not trustworthy in the small stuff, why would anybody entrust precious things, really valuable things to us? Because Jesus' principle is that how we handle small things reveals clearly how we will handle big things. You're not going to be faithful in a big thing if you're not faithful in small things. Now, we think, we tend to think, 
that we would take the big stuff seriously. If someone would just see our raw talent and entrust the big project, the big promotion, the broader responsibility to us, if someone would just give us the, the power and responsibility that we deserve, we would succeed. We would elevate our game and step into that role. But come on. I mean, just think about your work experience for a second. Think about the incompetent or lazy person in your workplace that you saw get elevated, get promoted above you. you. Seen that happen before? Most of you, probably all of you, have seen that lazy, incompetent person promoted unjustly. Well, tell me this. Did that person all of a sudden start succeeding with greater power and responsibility? Of course not. You know what happened. It was a mess. So friends, let's not think that you and I are the exception. Let's not think that, that we are the one who can be kind of sloppy and cut corners at a lower level, but if somebody would just give us more responsibility, then we'd succeed, then we'd flourish. No, friends, Jesus calls us to be faithful in small things. I mean, he, he's applying what he's saying here to what we, he's just talked about related to money. Jesus is saying, unless we're faithful with small amounts of money, again, he calls this unrighteous wealth. It's the way people of the unrighteous world do business. Unless we're faithful with small amounts of money, we'll never be faithful with big amounts of money, right? Isn't that his point? Well, just wait a second, because I don't think it is. Look closely, closely with me there at verse 11. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? There's a difference between unrighteous wealth, the money of this world, and true riches, that which will last forever. Do you understand Jesus' point here? Jesus is saying that unrighteous wealth, money, treasure in this world, that's the small stuff. It's insignificant from the perspective of eternity. And if we're not faithful in the stuff that just lasts for a few decades, why would God entrust something to us that lasts for eternity? Wealth. Wealth that you may possess right now, that is not true riches. Money is just the stuff that will not last. I mean, we print it on paper. In fact, we don't even use the paper much anymore. And it comes down to basically ones and zeros and trust in the federal government, all right? How's that working out for you? That's what we got. From, eternal, from an eternal perspective, from God's perspective, our money is small potatoes. What you own now, your wealth, your land, your buildings, your, your money, what you own now is a training exercise for eternity. It's a test for how capable you are of taking care of God's true riches. So friends, following Jesus means valuing money accurately. Following Jesus means understanding that what you have now is not of that great a value, not nearly as great a value as our hearts tell, it is, tell us it is. But then third and finally in verse 13, we see that following Jesus means relating to money independently. You can't let it control you. You must not. Verse 13, in concluding the story, his application of the story, Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, we know those words. For most of us, that's not the first time we've heard those words. And how many times have we heard that and affirmed it? and gone right on pursuing money and wealth. I mean, friends, Jesus would say to us, you may think you can, but only one, only God or money will occupy the throne in your heart. I don't often quote Bob Dylan, but when I do, it's from his song, you gotta serve something. Everybody serves something. But you can't serve it all. You can't have divided loyalties. The creator of the universe, the sovereign God, will not allow that. Only one, only one, God or money, will wield the power in your, in your life. And you know what you'll do? You'll use one 
to get the other. You'll use God to get money, or, you, or you'll use money to serve the Lord. Okay, so just think. Think about where the money goes. Think about how you desire to get it, what you desire to have. Do you use your money to serve God? Or are you using God to, to acquire more wealth? Is money your servant or is it your master? I mean, would any of us really admit, would we admit that money is our master? Would any of us would just say, yeah, sure, money rules my heart? I doubt that. I want to offer a few, a few questions, some kind of diagnostic questions. You, know, you take your car to get the diagnostic testing done when it's not running right. You go to the, you go to the, to the, to the doctor who, who does a blood test to do diagnostics on what's going on with your body, right? Here's some diagnostic questions for your heart, for your spiritual heart, to help you determine what it loves. Just a few. You can think of others. So what do you fear losing? What is it that you own that you fear not having anymore? What possession is it that if you lost it, if it was foreclosed upon, if it was stolen, that it would really break your heart? Another question, in what areas of our lives would we get anxious if we failed? Okay, so if we failed in our ability to drive the income stream, to gain advancement in the workplace, what areas of our lives would we get anxious, uptight, and fearful if we failed? That might point us to something that we love out of order. We could ask ourselves, what are our biggest ambitions? What do we daydream about? What sort of legacy do we daydream about leaving, leaving behind? What do we want people to remember us for? What are our biggest ambitions? Whose name do we want to make great? What do you want to look back in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and reflect upon with joy? Okay, what's on your bucket list? What are, what are some items on that bucket list that have something to do with God's kingdom? What are things you want to accomplish before you draw your last breath that are about some place you want to go or something you want to do or something you want to have that are about making the name of Jesus great in a place or in a life where his name is not now great, where he is not now worshipped. How will fruitful ministry continue after your life is over because of how you gave your life, your time, your energy, your treasure, to build it? Do you want fruitful ministry here or elsewhere to continue after your life is gone because in some way God, the Holy Spirit, used you to, to start it, to build it, to give it momentum? How will that continue after your life is done because of how God used you? And one more question. If people, people who really know you, Tell the truth about you at your funeral. What will they say? What will they say that he or she loved? That he or she gave his or her life to acquire? What will they say that she was devoted to? And I might add, if you can hear from heaven, will you be able to turn to Jesus and look him into the face and say that everything that these people are talking about, you get the glory for it? I would encourage you to organize your life in such a way that you'll be able to look Jesus in the eye. As people remember your life, you'll be able to look him in the eye and say that it happened because of him, not because of you or because you trying to acquire things for yourself. So friends, we see here clearly in this text that Jesus cares how we use our money. Jesus wants us to invest our money shrewdly, more shrewdly than the sons of this earth. Those are his words in Luke. So let us study our own hearts to see how we are using our wealth, what it's accomplishing. What is it accomplishing? What is wealth accomplishing in your heart? Are you seeking immediate indulgence or are you pursuing eternal objectives?
I want you to ask yourself, are you, with your money, following your money, or are you following Jesus? You will follow one. Which is it? Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would impress upon us in our hearts an awareness of our love for money that supersedes our love for you. Expose to ourselves the ways in which the wrong God is on the throne, ways in which we have placed us, our desires, our wealth on the throne and denied the rightful throne to you. Expose to us our sin, our idolatry. Drive us, drive us to repentance and to seek forgiveness, to believe that you will grant that forgiveness. And Father, we pray that you would make us a people who one day at the throne of Jesus gathered around as we sing praise to him, we'll be able to look around and see people there who have welcomed us, who are praising Jesus in some way because you have torn the clutches of our hearts away from our wallets and focused our use of our money upon eternal things. Father, this will not happen because of our willpower. It will be ha happen because of the power of the Holy Spirit. May it be true among us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we confess both our unworthiness and our worth because your son has paid the ransom for us at the cross and redeemed us. Lord, as we sing that our souls are satisfied in Christ alone, we know that we fall short of that aspiration. But Lord, your Holy Spirit has made it more and more our desire. So may the day come soon when it is fully true, when our souls are satisfied, satisfied in Christ alone.
Set us free, we pray, from the, from the love of what we possess here and now. Fix our hearts on praising your name and enjoying your greatest treasures for all eternity. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.